So Riverpod, it's a great state management tool, but the only problem with it is a little bit complex to learn. I promise you though, once you do learn it pretty well, it's gonna make your life a lot easier with Flutter. Riverpod has some very amazing features, but it also has a lot of features. One thing though, is you do not need to use all the features necessarily. So we're gonna go over the very basic ones that I use. And then once you're comfortable with those basic ones that I use, you can move on to the other features and try some other things out with Riverpod. But with these basic ones that I use, you can achieve almost anything you want. So let's get into it. So I've been using Riverpod as my main state management for like two months, I'd say, and I really have started to like it. It definitely takes a little bit to get comfortable with, but once you're comfortable with it, you realize it's actually not that complex and it's really nice to use. I've had multiple times where I've been like, oh, this is gonna be a really hard problem to solve, but then using Riverpod, it becomes a really easy problem. So goal today is to simplify what Riverpod is by a lot, show you how to use it, and then whenever you're ready, you can explore some more of the topics and see what other complex things you could do. So like I said, Riverpod has a lot of features, but you really don't need to use most of them. It just gives you a ton of options to do things differently in any way that you like. So to start off, there's three different packages that you could use for Riverpod. There's Riverpod itself, there's Flutter Riverpod, and then there's Hooks Riverpod. Now the thing is, for most projects, you probably only need to use one. In fact, I only use one of them. So let's break it down. Hooks River Pod is great if you know how to use Flutter Hooks really well. You just kind of add this on and you can use all your Flutter Hooks and use Hooks for River Pod as well. And then River Pod itself is really good because you don't actually need Flutter for it. You can use state management with just Dart itself. And then there's the last one that's Flutter River Pod, which is basically just the basic River Pod that you need to use with Flutter. So basically you could break it down like this. Normal River Pod is for Dart. Flutter River Pod is for Flutter. And then Hooks River Pod is just fancy for Flutter. I personally just stick with this middle one. And that's what we're gonna go through today, just Flutter Riverpod, just the very basic one for Flutter. There we go, so we narrowed it down to just Flutter Riverpod. Now we're gonna narrow it down to two basic concepts, a consumer and a provider. A consumer is simple enough, it lets you watch or monitor your providers and change the UI if the data changes inside your provider. And the more complex one is the providers. We can break it down to two different types of providers, ones that actually hold and can manipulate state, and the other one is just providing data. So the ones that can hold and manipulate state are change notifier and state notifier, there might be some other ones, I'm not sure, but these are the two main ones. And then ones that can just provide data are provider, future provider, stream provider, and state provider. I think there's other ones for that as well, but these are definitely the four main ones. So once again, we have a lot of options, but we probably don't need to use most of them. For example, to hold and manipulate state, you can have either a mutable or immutable solution. The one that most experienced developers recommend is the immutable option, which is the state notifier. And then to provide data, I only use these top three over here. I'm sure there are cases when a state provider is very useful, but if you're trying to maintain some state, you can just use the state notifier too. So now Riverpod becomes a lot less complex. We only have one package, we have one consumer, we have one way to maintain and manipulate state, and then we have three ways to provide that data. And then we have three ways to provide that data. And I want to reemphasize again that these aren't the only things that Riverpod does. There's things like provider listeners, provider observers, and I'm sure there's many other things it could do. But with these concepts that I've illustrated here, I haven't ran into a scenario that I can't accomplish without them. Now we got those concepts, let's go into the code and show you how I use them within the code. So here I have the starter app for this project. It's very simple, just a home screen with a column of three text widgets and two buttons that don't do anything. We have a providers file that has no providers yet. We're gonna get to that. And then we have a fake database. I could probably rename this class to fake database, but whatever, you get the point. We have four functions in here. One says get user data, which will just return my name after three seconds delay. And then we have the actual fake database. So we can hold some values here. We can init that value. We can increment that value and we can decrement that value all after three seconds. You can just pretend this is stored in Firebase and these calls are actual Firebase calls. So all right, now to implement our providers and everything. First, we need to go to the YAML file and install Flutter Riverpod. Once we got that installed, we can go to the database file. And this is just how I like to structure it. There might be better ways to structure your providers and where to organize them. But within the database file, I like to actually give a provider to that database. So this line of code right here provides this database and all the functions that you can use within this database to the rest of your code. So we'll call this database provider. The reason I like to put it here is because this provider doesn't actually get used within our app or in the UI of our code. So if I don't use that database provider, how do I use it within the app? I'll have this separate provider screen where these are actual providers that will be used within the UI of our application. All right, so in here we can define a user provider. This actually returns the name of the user to the rest of the application. Now this you can actually use within the app. What we're doing here 
as it's just a future provider. Remember, that's one of the three provide data type of providers that we can use. And since it's just a database call, it's not like we're actually storing data on our actual app. We're just returning it back to the UI and letting them use that data. Obviously, if you want to maintain the state of the user, you could use a state notifier provider. But in this case, we're just getting the data. So we're not doing that. So within this provider, all we're doing is reading that database provider that we made and then just getting that user data from that function. Now, what's so nice about this future provider then? Let's replace this text widget with a consumer. So the consumer gives you a builder, which gives you the context, this watch that's very important, and a child. So the context is just the build context that you already have. This watch is the key part of the builder. This allows you to watch any provider that you want. So let's say you want the user provider here, and let's return that as well. So we want to watch for changes on this user provider. And then we can use the when function, which gives us all these nice fields to fill out. We have a loading state where we can return a circular progress indicator. We have an error state if our Firebase returns an error. We can just return the text error here. And then it, once we actually get our value for the user provider, we can just return that in a text widget as well. So you see, nice and simple. We just watch it and we have the loading error states and the data states all taken care of. We refresh, it goes right to it. But if we reload completely, we'll see the loading for three seconds and then our name it pops up. And doing it this way makes your code a lot safer. You'll see, let's say we didn't define our error state here. We'll get a little squiggly line over here that we need to define an error state. So you know you're always safe from any type of things that could happen within your app where you're using a provider. There's four other functions you could use with the watch. The dot map is the same thing as when, except it returns the actual object of whatever your future provider returns. So here we'll just have an async data of string and then we can get that value by doing value.value. .value. So it's really up to you whether you want the whole object or just the actual content of it. Then there's also maybe when, where you can define, let's say we only care about the data field, and then whatever else happens, we just return the circular progress indicator. We don't really care about the error state, for example, here. We just always want it to load it unless we have the data. And then you have the same thing with maybe map. Now with the stream provider, it's literally the same exact thing as this. You just call a watch the stream and then when you have data and when you don't have data. All right, so let's get to a little bit more complex part. Like I said, you can probably just use a state notifier if you're looking for mutability. You don't really need to worry about change notifier. And it seems like state notifier is the one that's recommended by most experienced developers. So what is a state notifier? It can actually hold the state and you can write functions that manipulate that state. And it's literally like most state management solutions. So here's the basic layout of a state notifier. I like to give them the name controller at the end because you can actually control the data within there. For providers, you're literally just providing data. Controllers, you can actually control it. So we have a state notifier provider that returns a counter notifier state. We initialize that class and here's the actual definition of that class. So since this extends a state notifier, this returns an actual state. We can manipulate that state by Let's say we want to add to it. We just do state equals state plus one. And then to subtract it, we do the same thing except a minus here. So right, that's a very simple state notifier provider for a counter. Now let's say we want to maintain the state throughout the app. No matter what screen we're on, we'll always have this controller ready for us to use. Now for this one, we're going to do a very similar thing where we get a consumer, we have our builder, and then we can watch that counter controller. But with state notifiers, you're not watching the actual controller you're watching the state of the controller. So here we're watching counter controller dot state. We're watching it for any changes. And then we obviously need to return a two string and wrap it in a text in order to show it. And there we go, we have zero. I'm gonna add a little test that says basic that we know that this is the basic state notifier. And down here for the raise button, we don't actually need to call a consumer because we're not consuming that widget. We don't wanna watch it. We just wanna use the function defined on our controller. So this will do context.read. We're gonna read the counter controller and then we just click the add and there we go, it's that simple. So this read.add will update our state notifier provider, will update that state, and since this consumer is watching on that state, it will update our counter. It's nice, simple, and clean. We do the same exact thing for the subtract, and now we have a complete counter ready to go. That's a very simple state that I managed within the app, but it gets a little more complex if we're using Firebase, for example. For this, we're gonna copy this code. That's gonna be pretty similar, but we're gonna call it counter async controller. And this one will use a counter async notifier because it's obviously asynchronous. And here, instead of just returning an integer, we're gonna return an async value with integer. So what the heck is this async value? If you remember when we were looking at the feature provider earlier, we saw that it returned an object called async data. So the async data is extended from async value. And using this async value gives us a little bit more control 
and more things we could do with our watch. So now, now you notice our functions over here don't really work anymore. First things first, whenever it's initialized, we're gonna initialize it with async loading. There's three different types of async values. You can use async value dot loading, and that is equivalent to async loading. To make it look nicer, you can just write it this way. It's literally the same exact thing. There's async value loading, data, and error, and then guard, but I haven't used that yet, I'm not sure. I should take a look, I guess. But loading, error, and data was the three that we saw with futures. So those are the most important ones, I think. So here we can use an initializer list. And before this state gets created, we run this init function. Inside the init function, we'll give the async data of zero. So this will return our actual data to be zero. But you'll notice we haven't actually called our database yet. And within this function, we don't really have the database. We can easily fix that by passing in a ref.read and by defining a variable here for the reader called read and passing it in here and then passing it in from here. Then within our init function, we can actually read that database provider and initialize that database. We can obviously take the value from this init and put it into the async data. That might be a little bit nicer, but that's not the approach we're gonna take here. Now, one recommendation that I have heard that I don't really use, but you should, definitely should think about it, is we can actually pass the read of the database provider here. And then you have the specific database or specific provider that you need already here. So then you have passed in the actual database that you need to use and it's a little bit cleaner. So look into that too, if you want to do that. But for this example, we're just gonna use a basic read. All right, so then let's say we go to add. Before we do anything, we're gonna do async loading. And we're gonna set our state to that so that we're in a loading state until we get our future response. So here's the rest of it. We read our count from our database provider. And then after it is done, we await it for three seconds it gets done, it gets stored into this variable, and we return async data for count. We can do the same exact thing for subtract. So now you're like, why go through all this trouble? Let's go back to the UI. So in the UI, we're gonna use a consumer now, and we're gonna have the builder again. And inside the builder, we're gonna have something very similar to the first one. We will return a watch on the counter async controller. We're gonna watch the state of it, but then we have the options of when, map, maybe when, and all those. And here we go, we have a nice safe consumer that controls data that comes from a database and or future values, wherever it comes from actually. And then on the button down here, if we do counter async controller, add and subtract, you'll see all of that is handled very nicely for us. So database calls, we're loading the data, one, two, three, and it shows up. This makes your app a lot safer. It makes your code a little bit nicer. You think storing state from Firestore or wherever you're storing it from is a little bit complex and maybe this looks like a little bit of boilerplate, but trust me when I tell you, this makes your life a lot easier. And we can increment and I'll go to this. An async value will adjust after three seconds. Everything just works. Everything's safe. Veripod will tell you when you haven't taken care of a specific case. And overall, it's just good. So this was the very basics and trying to break it down so you're able to achieve whatever you want. I'm going to go into a few more things that you might actually run into that you will need to use. There's two modifiers you can use on providers. There's auto dispose which you should probably use often so that this gets disposed if you leave the screen or if you're not using this provider anymore, it gets disposed for you. And then there's also family. So family allows you to pass in something as well. Let's say we want to pass in a string here. We can check like if str equals tatis, just return good tatis or something like that. If it doesn't equal that, get the user data from the database. So over here for our user provider, we're gonna pass in Tadis first and reload, and we'll get good Tadis. We put in Tadis P, we'll get from the database. So that's very useful as well. So with all that information, I'm pretty sure you should be able to build any app. At least I haven't ran into any hiccups yet either. But there's also provider listener you can look into, provider observer. Provider listener is definitely useful because you don't really adjust the UI, you just listen and can call functions. So I can definitely see some use cases for that. And then once you get all of this under control, once you're able to build apps with this stuff, you can look into all the other stuff that Riverpod provides. And you can even get fancy with it by using the hooks Riverpod and make your code a little more dense and maybe easier to use too. But okay, that's it for me. Hopefully I simplified Riverpod a little bit for you. If I did a good job with it, let me know in the comments. If there's anything else you wanna learn about Riverpod, also let me know. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share, and bye-bye.